All right, starting off this semester with eschatology. I don't know what eschatology means. It's not a word that's used a whole lot, I guess, in our churches. Uh, but it means the study of end times. So it's, it's prophecy, but specifically prophecy concerning end times. Uh, and I, the difference is some prophecies have already been fulfilled. Uh, so therefore, you like to Jesus be born in Bethlehem. That's an Old Testament prophecy, and that, but that's not a prophecy concerning end times. So we'll talk about prophecy concerning uh, the tribulation period, the millennial kingdom, uh, uh, things like that is what more eschatology deals with. Uh, but a very important study, uh, but it's a study that we have to be very careful of because there are some dangers when we study prophecy, we study eschatology, uh, and the danger sometimes is to sensationalize them or to make them more than what they really are. Uh, for whatever reason, people think that they have, some preachers, think they have to come up with something new that nobody's ever heard before. Or they uh, give information concerning prophecy that the Bible doesn't give. And that's why we always have to be careful. Uh, every time I hear somebody say, well, you know, this happened, does this mean Jesus is coming back soon? You know, no, it doesn't. Uh, could it be? Yeah, it could. But can we know that? No. Because the only prophecy that we know would be found in the Word of God. And so, you know, we're talking about the way the world is today, and uh, it is declining definitely. And the Bible does say in the last days that people will uh, uh, call that which good evil, and that which is evil good. And we see that today. So does this mean that Jesus is coming back soon? Maybe. But then again, it could be a hundred years from now. And so we, we don't know, and we, therefore we can't. Uh, I, I won't put myself out on a limb and say, oh, this means Jesus is coming back. You know, uh, there was a radio uh, owner, radio, had several radio station owner back in 2008 or 9, I can't remember his name now, but he said Jesus was coming back in like September of that year, of uh, 2009, whatever date it was. Uh, and so he broadcasted all over the place and put out flowers and all this information that Jesus coming back in September. Well, guess what? He didn't come back. And so he revised it and said, well, you kind of miscalculated here, but he's coming back in October or whatever. Well, that didn't happen either. And now that guy looks like a nut to everybody. You know, even if uh, the guy was a true believer, and he may be, for all I know, I don't know the guy, but he could be. Uh, and just absolutely mistaken, but, but nevertheless, now he looks like a nut to everybody. And so anything he has to say now, who's going to listen? And so if we, that's the danger of saying that, uh, I care a few uh, months ago, uh, there was a place in Texas where they said that they developed a uh, red heifer, or a cow that was red, and the Bible talks about in the Old Testament, that the first sacrifice was from a red, red heifer and the ashes were to be maintained. And so somewhere in Texas they supposedly had produced a, a red heifer and people saying, oh, that means the end is near. Uh, well, it, when I heard the information, and I heard from some good people, I still thought, no, I, I don't think that's it. I mean, could it be? Well, yeah, it could be, because like I say, God could use whatever. But the danger is saying, oh, this proves it. Uh, well, that was several months ago now. I hadn't heard anything since then about it. And then it's in Texas, not in Israel. So how, you know, how does that work? Uh, and so you know, we just have to be very, very careful. Uh, it's like on TV, this man named Jack Van Impey. I don't know if you ever saw him or not. But he makes these prophecies. And, and he used to have some good uh, teaching on prophecy. But then he started sensationalizing. He had to have more because everybody else was saying what he was saying. So he had to have get more. So he started saying that the next pope would be the Antichrist. Uh, well, the next pope was like three popes ago. You know, so he wasn't the, or the false prophet, he said. And that the king of Spain, Juan Carlos, is the Antichrist. Well, he's not the king of Spain anymore. So, you know, it's... You know, but when you make those statements now, I won't listen to them because I don't have time for that. I'm in a, uh, I forget the guy's name. He's on Christian TV. Uh, he does a lot of prophecy, and he is wrong, wrong on half the stuff he says. I mean, he takes the Bible completely out of context, 
or he'll say things that the Bible doesn't say. You know, it's like you know the three wise men. You know, and people are so. I mean, three wise men. You look them up; they have names. One is Melchior, one is a Gaspar, and the other is uh, I forget the third one now. But you look up, you find these three names for these three wise men. Well, there were the three wise men. So how could the names be their their names? It's just that somebody said it, and somebody wrote it down, and thought you know, a Melchior, uh, Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar were the so-called three. Uh, with the uh, uh, and like I said, the Bible didn't even say there was three wise men, since they brought three gifts, uh, and so who knows how many wise men it was. Uh, uh, it could have been two. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Could, could be one because the Bible does say wise men. Right. right? But it could two or could be 12. I mean, you, we don't know. And again, when we make those statements and it doesn't come to pass, then we look foolish. And so that's why we have to be very, very careful in the study of prophecy. And the danger is sensationalism. You know, uh, I know more than you do. You know, uh, just ask me, I can tell you when Jesus is coming back. That makes that person the authority. And we are I'm not the authority. The authority is the word of God. You know, uh, I base my uh, uh, Christian life not upon people, but upon God. And so when people fail me, I still serve God. In Acts 17, 21, it says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You know what Solomon says? Nothing new under the sun. Right. You know, and what are people doing today? The exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to come up with something new. Uh, uh, they want to learn something new or they want to tell something new and make themselves look good. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely... Uh, a great danger in this. Second Timothy, Paul said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, I mean, they're not listening to the truth. Now, Paul said, in the uh, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And we are in a time where people are not enduring sound doctrine. Uh, so does that mean that this is, well, this could be this time, and the next time, and the time after that, and the times in the past. Uh, remember the world, as bad as it might seem to us right now, the only world we have to look at is our own. If we could go back 500 years, I think we'd find that they've had a lot worse than we do. And especially go to other countries. They have it a whole lot worse than, than we've ever had in this country, as far as our uh, persecution of Christianity. And so we have to be, again, very careful about that. However, we do need to understand that, you know, when times are rough and people don't do a sound doctrine, the, uh, the warning is they, uh, but after their own lusts, and lusts, in other words, for lusts is covetous, you know, having things. Well, what do the prosperity preachers teach? I mean, they teach wealth and what? They rhymed. It was on last test. <laughs> oh, health. Health. Wealth oh, and health. Because uh, they rhymed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I said. Wealth and health. And what, what do people want in the world? Wealth and, wealth and health. health. How many people bought lottery tickets last week? A uh, billion of them. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't. Yeah. Uh, oh, me either. <laughs> yeah, so uh, somebody in Maine, I think, said one. Yeah. 1.45 billion or something like that. 1.35. 35, yeah. uh, whatever it was. And, it's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, uh, it's only like seven hundred fifty million after oh, that. That's and, all. Yeah. but it gives uh, money. <laughs> but, but that's people think that that will solve their problems. And I guarantee, if you got seven hundred fifty million dollars, all of a sudden you're gonna have a whole, gonna have a whole lot of problems. Yeah. You, I mean, you talk about uh, relatives. Oh, coming out the woodwork. Oh man, and you know, and feel like they deserve it. Yeah. Not not that they just can you help me. But hey, I'm your cousin. Yeah. You know, and I deserve this. And if you don't give it to me, then you know, then they will try to destroy you. Oh, boy. So it's not the blessing that most people think that it would be. Uh, but again, people think wealth or health. Yeah. And health is great. I mean, you know, it'd be great to have, have good health. Uh, but that's not what all life's about. 
mean, Jesus healed people, but he didn't heal them to make them healthy. He healed them to show that he was God. And so, because, you know, Lazarus died, God didn't do him any favors by bringing him back to life. I mean, that's a, that's a downgrade. You go to paradise, where things are wonderful, perfect, then you come back to this world, and when he came back, he rose from dead. What happened? The religious leaders did what? Sought to put him to death. So, you know, we have to, again, make sure, you know, that uh, the prophecies, we take them as they're written. Uh, in these days, people are turning to other things than the Word of God. Uh, less uh, church people percentage in the, this country today than ever been. Uh, and with prophecies, we need to understand too that oftentimes there could be double reference or in the fulfillment. Now, actually, sometimes it can be even more than that. But most of the time, they actually tend to be a double fulfillment. Uh, especially, of course, when you're reading from the Old Testament. It could be a, uh, a sign in the d days that the uh, people lived in the Old Testament, and also a sign for the future. Because the prophets, had, they had a message for their day. There was a reason God gave uh, the signs in the Old Testament. It wasn't just so that, you know, down the road, they knew that Jesus was coming back. And the same thing is true for even us today. The Old Testament prophecies, or, or New Testament prophecy fulfillments, that's already been fulfilled. Uh, they're not there just to show us what, what happened. And the prophecies of, of Jesus' return is not there just to tell us that one day he's coming back. Those prophecies are for a reason. And the reason is that we make sure we get our heart right with God. It's uh, 1 John 2, uh, 3. Uh, uh, beloved, now we the sons of God, and death not yet appear. What we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then the next verse says, And every man that hath this hope purifies himself, even as he is pure. And so what, what does that mean? Well, we know that one day Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, we'll, we'll be like him, and that will be glorified. And then the verse says, if everybody who has this hope, everybody who believes this, their requirement is to do what? To purify themselves. When? Now. And so the prophecy of Jesus coming back is a prophecy telling us we need to make sure that we are we purify ourselves on a regular basis. What was that scripture? First John 3, uh, 1, 2, and 3, actually. I didn't quote the first verse, but the second and third verse. Okay. Thank you. And so, again, the prophecy had a message for their day, just like New Testament prophecies are for now. And, you know, not the fulfillment of it, but the command behind it. Uh, and also to understand that the fulfillment of the historic became assurance of the future. When Daniel was given a prophecy and he saw those fulfilled, he knew that God would keep his word. And for us today as well, we look in the Old Testament, and you know, no archaeology, no scientist, no one in the world has ever came up with a fact that that disputes the Bible. As much as they try, evolutionists, the whole purpose of evolution is to uh, deny God. It's not to come up with the truth. They don't want the truth. Evolutionists will set flat out and lie to people about things with a straight face trying to convince us that there's no God. When the fact is, nothing that he's ever done has proven uh, uh, that evolution is right and creation is wrong. Daniel, prophecy, we talked about that in the course in the Daniel class where uh, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 give prophecies concerning a little horn. Uh, and if you don't read the Bible carefully, as too many people don't read it carefully, uh, you won't, you'll think that the little horn in seven, little horn in eight, is the same one. Right, right there all together, Daniel's talking about that, but then when you look, start looking at the details, 
you'll find that the little horn of seven is the Antichrist. And then God, in chapter 8, says that he'll send like a forerunner of the Antichrist ahead of that. Uh, the Antichrist will rule for 2,560 days, uh, the Bible tells us, which is seven prophetical years, whereas the little horn of chapter 8 will only rule for 2,300 days. And so if you look at it, you think, okay, well, that's a mistake in the Bible. Here it says 2,560, and here it says 2,300, whereas it's 260 days. But then you realize, wait a minute, this little horn is different from this little horn. This little horn comes out of uh, this nation, uh, whereas this little horn comes out of a different one. Well, this little horn here in chapter 8 is uh, Antiochus. Uh, we call him Antiochus IV. Some people call him Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus IV is his name, and uh, Epiphanes is his title. Uh, it actually means the great one. It's like Caesar. Uh, Caesar is a title, it's not a name. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's not a name, it's a title. Uh, and so he came uh, uh, in about 175 B.C. Uh, he ruled for 2,300 days. When 2,300 uh, uh, day, the Maccabees came and ran him out of town, uh, got, kicked him out of Israel. Uh, but he did some things that looked like the same things the Antichrist did. Uh, he defiled the temple by offering up a pig in the temple. The Antichrist will defile the temple by offering up himself and proclaim himself to be God in the temple in the tribulation period. And so, if you don't look at these carefully, like I say, it's easy to get confused about them. And a lot of people are confused about them. And that's why you have to look at every detail of the Bible uh, to make sure that you're right in who you're talking about. It's like I say, if you talk about uh, Jehoram, uh, Jehoram was king. Uh, you can look at Jehoram, and if you look at all the references in the Bible for Jehoram, you can be, get, get very con confused because one says Jehoram is the king of Judah, and another says he's the king of Israel. So is that a mistake in the Bible? No. Why? There's two Jehorams. I mean, how many Johns are there in this world? Yeah, you know? I mean, it, it's just amazing. I mean, well, and it's very clear in the Bible that. Jehoram was the uh, uh, husband of uh, Athaliah, Athaliah, mm -hmm. right? But Jehoram was also the brother of Athaliah. Okay. So was her husband, her brother? No. Jehoram Judah was her husband. Jehoram Israel was her brother, who all lived at the same time. And so if you're not, again, not careful... You can be easily confused by the name Jehoram. You know, how come Jehoram, here it says he reigned this long, and this, here's Jehoram reigned this long. Well, because it's two different people. And again, you have to carefully read the Word of God. You know, I stress this all the time, and I'm sure you'll agree you've heard this word before, context. Yeah. Right? You have to get the Bible in proper context. There are dual or partial fulfillments. The prophet in the Old Testament may understand the historical benefit of the prophecy, but not the future fulfillment. And have this this line here, like gives a representative here. In the Old Testament age, you say a prophet was standing right here on, on this uh, spot right here in the Old Testament, and he were to look over the top of this mountain. Well, all he would see is the Old Testament age and the tribulation. Okay? He wouldn't see anything else. He would just look up the top and think, okay, this is a straight line from here to there. And so we have the Old Testament, we have tribulation. Oops. What he would not see was the church age. Okay? And so uh, when Daniel prophesied, he prophesied that uh, in Daniel 9, 24, uh, 70 weeks are determined for my people, uh, he says, and then he talks about the time period of 490 years. So Daniel would then have looked out at 490 years and say, okay, Messiah will, is coming at the end of the 483rd year, and he will die 
And then Daniel would say, then the very next event after Jesus, the Messiah's death, would be the tribulation period. So after the 489th year comes the well, well, for us, we know that, but Daniel would have. He so he thought, okay, after 489, it would be 490, which would make sense. He did not realize that there would be a, uh, a time period between the uh, coming of Messiah, and, uh, or his death of Messiah, and his tribulation period. You wouldn't see that intermission. You remember talking about, like in a movie, you have intermission. When the intermission's over with, the movie starts back right where it left off. So, for the uh, uh, church age, when the church age is over with, then the Old Testament res resumes right where it left off. After the 489th week, 49th week. So we're in intermission. We are the intermission. Okay. Yep. And so, the Old Testament didn't predict this intermission. It didn't say there would be a time period between that. Because nowhere in the Old Testament do we find the church. Uh, all they see is uh, after the death is uh, the tribulation period and then the millennial kingdom. So there was no prophecy about the church age in the Old Testament. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing. nothing in the Old Testament uh, is an illustration of the church. Okay. Right. okay. So how would I explain that? Because you know uh, you've got people that are, yeah? Oh, I know, I, I, know, yeah. I know you do, but, uh, well, for one thing, example, show me. Show me an illustration in the Old Testament. Show me a prophecy uh, in the Old Testament concerning the church. There's none. I know. That's, yeah. that's why I say it would be hard to really put it in words to, to a class. Yeah. Like you put it, because you have an illustration, you got that. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've wondered about that, you know. I don't, you know, I, I, just personally. It's just a, a, a constant teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and the more people learn the Bible, the easier it is for them to see that, the truth of that. Uh, I also found that people who don't want to believe the truth. Oh, they don't believe, not believe can, the truth. You just stand up there so, talking to your green. Right. right. Okay. Yeah, I can tell them there's no prophecy. Oh, yes, there is. <laughs> show me. Well, I can't show you, but I know there. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, they, they're just going to be stuck. They just want to argue. They, they and, did. and I don't have time to argue. Mm -hmm. It's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can prove me wrong, then prove me wrong. Mm -hmm. But other than that, no. Uh, and, and if I can be proved wrong, I'll be proved wrong. You don't get me wrong. If you can find something in, in the Bible that contradicts anything that I ever say, show me. Because I want the truth. I don't want to keep, to keep going on with false teaching. Uh, it's easy to do that. To teach something that you've heard and you've believed all your life and you never really thought about it, but you've heard it so many times, you start teaching the same thing, then one day you realize, wait a minute, the Bible doesn't say that. You know, the, uh, uh, in the Millennial Kingdom, the lie and the lamb. The Bible says the lie and the lamb will lie down together. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. It says the lion and the goat, I think it is. Uh, Somewhere in Isaiah. Uh, but for whatever reason, people believe the lion and the lamb yeah. is mentioned in the Bible. And I think you've seen pictures of Oh, yeah, there's absolutely pictures yeah. of it. I, I had a picture of one yeah. at one time. It's in your head. Yeah. Yeah, and it's been said and repeated, and after a while, people believe it. Yeah. Uh, and they never go read for themselves. Yeah. They believe what people say. Well, what did the innkeeper say when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem? I think they said there was some more room in the, in the end of something like that. I think there was some more room. No room in the end, something like that. Uh -huh. yeah. Something like that. No. Nowhere in the Bible. And says, you told us that before, anything. but I can't yeah. even yeah. remember exactly yeah. what but you told it, us that before. It, it like the Bible doesn't say anything. The end can, it's not even mentioned well, you, you said in you the Bible. Us that but, but we believe it because we've seen yeah. the Christmas. Uh, uh, pageants on in our church where yeah. there's always some guy. And we've been told yeah, that, but told we don't go read it for ourselves. Okay. That's like, but they didn't even go to an end. Did, did, did they go to an end? Uh, really, <laughs> it doesn't say that they did go to an end. It just says there was no room for them in the end. <laughs> so we don't even know that for sure. So again, that's why we have to be very, very careful when we read the Bible yeah. and when we teach. You know, as a teacher, you've got a great responsibility. Absolutely. You know, because you, even if 100% of the people in your church don't agree with you, 
You still have a teacher, right, Ben? And you know, Dr. K, um, after being here for a while, I understand why you always tell us King James Version. King James, because some of the other versions will change stuff, they the change. wording, and it's confusing. Absolutely. It definitely can change yeah, the, the but, wording, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes by changing the wording, changes the meaning. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and sometimes in the other versions, it leaves words out. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I'm so, just saying, yeah. I understand why it's so important yeah, it to, is. to go to the King James Version. It, as I've already said, if God only said 10 words, how many of those are important? All of them. All, all ten. You know, you don't don't take the ten and kind of paraphrase it down to four. Every word is important, and that's the King James is the only uh, uh, English Bible, major English Bible. There might be somebody else did one, but uh, the only English Bible is a word for word translation from the, the uh, manuscripts, uh, the majority text. Prophecy also demonstrates the accuracy of the Bible. When the wise men did come to seek Jesus, where did they first go? Well, they first went to Jerusalem. And then Herod heard of this group of men who came to seek out the Messiah. And he sent for them, and he asked his religious leaders, uh, what's this about Messiah? And they said, well, yeah, there is a prophecy of, uh, in Micah that he'd be born in Bethlehem. And so uh, uh, they went to there, and then they went to the house that Jesus was in. And when he was born, he wasn't in a house. He was in a manger, uh, in a barn. And so now the house, and then Harry put out a decree that all the babies from two years old and younger would be killed. Mm -hmm. So that means that Jesus is in a house. Why two years? Well, uh, Harry probably wanted to make sure that he got him. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus could have been a year old, could have been not, uh, 18 months old, he could have been who knows how old, really. We don't know exactly. Uh, but Harry just wanted to make sure that he got him. So again, it shows that the wise men came, they went to Jerusalem, then they went to seek Jesus wherever he was at. And, and finally found him. We assume it was Bethlehem, but it just says went to the house where they put him in. So again, we have to be very careful. But it demonstrated the accuracy of the Bible. Uh, uh, Micah 5 2 says that Jesus be born of Bethlehem, Ephratah. Well, Ephratah was the old name of Bethlehem before it was Bethlehem. Because there was at least one other Bethlehem. In fact, some uh, writers say there was actually a total of three Bethlehems in Israel at that time. The only one was Bethlehem Africa. And I've told y'all before about Walkertown. Mm -hmm. You know, there's three Walkertowns in North Carolina, but there's only one Walkertown for South County. Uh, the other is uh, at Black Mountain. I don't know what county that's at. And the other one's on the other side of Raleigh, and I'm not sure what county it's in. But if you want to know which one, you would need to know more than just the name Walkertown. Where would Jesus be born? Bethlehem. Well, there's three Bethlehem. Okay, God says Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And so the accuracy of the Bible. And the test for prophecy, uh, prophecy the authenticity of its source is, is the fulfillment, or uh, and fulfillment. It should say and, not is. Authenticity of its source and fulfillment. Yeah. Who, who said it? Okay. Right. Who, who said it? Well, if uh, um, Judas Iscariot gave a prophecy, uh, the source is not very reliable. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure that the source, uh, Daniel was prophet, Paul and his prophecies, uh, he gave many prophecies, concerning the end times. Uh, so who, who was the person? No. And then, did it come to pass? You remember, to go back to Deuteronomy 13 and 18, uh, I believe it is, uh, you look at the qualifications of a prophet, uh, the signs of a prophet, and one is, uh, if he says things, 
and they uh, don't come to pass. Well, if he, if, I, if he predicts them and it didn't come to pass, then is he a true prophet? No. no. What if it comes to pass? Does that prove he's a true prophet? No. No, it don't. Because if it comes to pass, but it contradicts the Bible, mm -hmm. then he's not a true prophet. Right? Uh, can Satan have people prophesy things that do come to pass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know that in the tribulation period, God will give people strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Yeah. And in the Old Testament, there's going to, I mean, in the tribulation period, there's going to be false prophets. Old Testament, there is false prophets. In Jesus' day, there was false prophets. Today, there are false, false prophets, prophets out there. Yeah. Uh, and so, again, we go to the source. Who are they? Are they accurate? And so, Deuteronomy says, if they prophesy and it comes to pass, then make sure that it's in line with the Bible. If not, then they're to be stoned to death. If they don't come to pass, they're to be stoned to death. So the purpose of prophecy is its spiritual impact on God's people. That's very, very important here. The purpose of prophecy is its spiritual impact on God's people. See, the purpose of prophecy is not knowing what's going to happen in the tribulation period. That's not the purpose of it. It's not for us to know what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. The purpose is the spiritual impact upon my life when I learn about the tribulation period. What's the spiritual impact on my life when I learn about the millennial kingdom? Well, I know that God keeps his word. And then I go back again to 1 John 3. Every man that hath his hope purifies himself. So if I believe Jesus is coming back, then spiritually right now, I need to make sure that I'm living for him. That I'm striving to be absolutely perfect in my life. I purify myself. And a sign of a person who really believes Jesus is coming back is going to be purifying themselves. You know, when I got saved, I got saved in a, uh, uh, it was a regular Baptist church. Uh, and I'm sorry, not regular, it was a free will Baptist church. Uh, free will Baptist churches believe that you can lose your salvation. Uh, I was only in the church twice, uh, um, one time, one Sunday, and one Saturday when I got saved. Uh, and I remember going home with a, a girl I was uh, dating at the time and her family uh, that I went to church with. And I got to their house after I got saved, and I said, well, I'm just so excited. I can't wait for uh, Jesus to come back. And I don't even know how I knew he's coming back, to be honest with you. Uh, but every single person in the room kind of stopped and thought, I, I need to get some things straight before he comes back. I don't want him to come back too soon. And it's like they just burst my bubble. I remember I was like excited and thought, oh, no. <laughs> it's, why aren't you excited? Because well, I got to get things right. Look, if you know you got to get things right, you get things right. You know, I may have told you all this. I remember in the class I was in in college, and the professor asked one of the students to pray, and the student raised hand and said, you know, um, uh, he said, I'm sorry, Professor, but right now there's, there's things in my life that's not right with God, and I need to get them right before I feel like I can pray. And I, at the time I thought, well, that's, that's good. Okay, at least you realize, you know, uh, and then a few weeks later, the Professor called on him again to pray, and he said on the exact same thing. Then I thought, you know what? That's stupid. It's not only stupid. Now, it was stupid the first time to come to think of it. Because if I go to class, Bible college, knowing my heart's not right with God, how easy is, is, is it to get your heart right? All you got to do is ask God to forgive you. Yeah, it's, it doesn't take days and hours or months or whatever. It just takes a right and repentant attitude. Mm -hmm. And he could, should have done that at first. We should always be ready to pray. Absolutely. I mean, always. You drive down the road, car falls off a bridge, and you're the first one there, mm -hmm. and the person's uh, ready to die. And you said, well, I pray for you, but you know, I got some things I need to make right with God first. Oh, <laughs> you know, how important would that be? Yeah. Instant in prayer. You know, instant in season, out of season. But instantly, we should be able to do these things. So, prophecy 
should affect our spiritual impact upon uh, upon our own personal lives. Dr. K, that is very a very true statement, but I just, for me personally, want to add to that because it helps build my faith. Well, that's the spiritual mm -hmm. impact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really helps build my faith. The more you know about the prophecy of the mm -hmm. Bible, that God keeps his word, well, his word is faith, isn't it? Yeah. Faith comes by hearing, hearing yes. by the word. So his word is faith. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a break.